Today's episode is sponsored by The Dark Room. What's up? It is once again me, your boy Walmart Ryan Gosling, here to tell you about this camera on my freaking day off. The Pentax 17 is the hot new thing in the film photography community. But why? Well, shit, probably because it's a brand spanking new emphasis on the spank film camera produced by a major camera company in 2024. What a concept. We no longer have to rely on cameras that are older than us. This all started when Rico slash Pentax dropped an Avengers level teaser trailer accepting the call to action. They announced they were beginning a project to build a new film camera. Gotta love their honesty as well. In the videos they say, you know, multiple times that if they hit a monumental obstruction in the build process, they're just gonna give up completely. And as somebody who gives up on things pretty easily, I kind of admire that. Obviously they succeeded and they built out the Pentax 17, which is really a huge accomplishment and means a lot to the film community. They were able to effectively source new parts and build a brand new working pipeline for a completely original camera. But I will say, going into this, I did really want to hate on this camera a lot, and I still will a little bit. It just seemed like, you know, everything we heard about it didn't really get me very excited, and I'll explain why later. But for now, let's look at the camera in one of my famous downward zoomed in dick shots. So. Here's the camera. It's honestly uh, not too bad looking. The top plate even kind of looks like titanium, which at first had me pretty aroused, but uh, it's not titanium, so I may never learn to love again. This camera itself feels pretty good in the hands. It's small and uh, very lightweight, but it feels incredibly rigid. It does not feel fragile, at least not as fragile as my ego. I mean, I could probably snap it in half, but that's only because, you know, I have the physique of a Greek god. This camera uh, will not work without a battery, much like how I won't without a reason to live. It takes a CR2 battery, which are pretty common, and, and uh, you know, they taste okay. But come on, shut up, Jason. We wanna see how this camera performs in the field. We literally don't give a rat's ass about you. Fair enough, Caleb and I hit the road out into the desert in search of photography. Three hours later, we arrived in Bad Decisionville. Temperature, 116 degrees Fahrenheit. We don't f around with any of that commie Celsius bull crap over here. It's a nice breezy. 112 out here. The manual for this camera doesn't really tell you much. In fact, you might as well just send it on its way and give it a Viking funeral. But you know, definitely observe local fire ordinances. Trust me on that one. It does actually tell you not to expose this camera to high temperatures, which I blatantly ignored by going to the desert. I mean, come on. It also says not to expose the camera to toxic gases. So what are you gonna do? Just not rip ass around it? <laughs> Hi Rico, I hope you're enjoying the video so far. So with gooch sweat from the 116 degree heat outside, making it look like we shit ourselves already, we head into the air conditioning for a quick lunch. This cafe was super photogenic. There was a ton of blue to work with, an interesting challenge for a competent photographer. Unfortunately, there wasn't one anywhere to be found, so I gave it a crack. It's very easy to load this thing. I put in some basic ass Portra 400, and then I set the ISO dial to 400 because this camera does not feature a DX code reading, which I guess is a good thing for those DX code-less cartridges, but a bad thing because you'll likely forget to change your ISO at least once. <laughs> So up top here, you have your uh, your film advance, which like one of my nipples is tiny. Next to the film advance, you have your uh, your shutter button, and then of course your uh, shooting modes dial. The other side, you have your exposure compensation dial, as well as your set ISO dial. Okay, that's pretty sick actually. It's rare to have some, uh, you know, manual f around ability on something, I guess, this small. Uh, so furthermore, on the topic of ISO, it ranges from about 50 to 3200, and there's even an ISO lock button, if I can find it, yeah, right there. But, you know, with the uh, exposure compensation button here, the ISO really extends from like 12 ISO to 12,800, and yeah, if you're shooting anything outside of those ranges, then I'm frightened of you, from what I've heard, and this is not verified at all. The shutter speed on this only goes up to like 1 320th or something like that. It's not like the manual would tell you or anything that could be useful. I'm telling you, just stab the damn thing and, you know, watch out for the cursed Voldemort black ooze when you do. Anyway, back on topic, just uh, beware of overexposure if you're shooting high-speed film is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so you might have noticed a little bit of grain on these photos. So two things. One, some of the shots are backlit. That's on me. I'll tell you right now that the light meter on this camera located right above the lens is flawless. The user, on the other hand, 
is flawed. But let's talk about the other elephant in the room. This camera is half frame format. It will yield half the resolution of full frame 35 millimeter film. Instead of 36 by 24 millimeters, it is 17 by 24 millimeters. That's why it's called the, uh, the Pentax 17, which I totally understood on the first try and definitely did not need somebody to explain it to me. Half frame format is, um, is unique and some people really enjoy it. Who those people are, I don't know. I've only heard about them. With half frame, you can scan the images as singles or unique pairs, often called diptychs or dick pics if you're dyslexic. But whatever, let's just call it like it is. 35 millimeter full frame, which this camera is not, is already barely cutting it, you know, resolution wise. It works, you know, don't get me wrong, but barely, I think. Half frame means that the orientation of the photos by default is vertical. You actually have to turn the camera sideways to take a horizontal picture. It's backwards, which always gives me you know, kind of a headache, but that might actually be related to the Gonsters that I chugged right before this to even me out. Sorry in advance if I have any back sweat. With half frame, you actually get 72 photos on a standard 36 roll of 35 millimeter film, which is pretty economic. You're doubling the amount of shots you get, but you're ultimately trading resolution for economy. With film prices going up, this choice definitely makes a lot of sense to the generation that just wants to take pictures and post to Instagram and do nothing else with their work, which is fine because resolution doesn't matter there. I just hope that the newcomers to film don't get too deterred by the, I guess, lower quality of the film format. Me personally, I think I'd rather just have full frame and be a little bit more picky with my shots. And also, yeah, 72 frames is gonna take a fucking lifetime to get through. Unless, of course, you have a more interesting life than me and actually have a reason to live. I mean, take photos. Anyway, after butt chugging that milkshake, except with my mouth, we left the cafe back into the heat. Are there any uh, film photographers around? I signed like some pretty serious NDAs for this. thing for landscape is throwing me. Twelve shots of 72. It's gonna be a long day. The lens on this camera is a 25 millimeter 3.5, which is equivalent to about a 36 millimeter lens on full frame. And it even says HD on it somewhere. Yeah, right there. Which I don't really think actually means anything to film photography, but you know, maybe I'm wrong. Overall, gotta say, it's a very, very sharp lens. It's got, you know, modern day coatings that can certainly take it a long way. I think most people will be happy with the lens on this, you know, except of course the shallow depth of field crowd who will probably slam their fist on their desk and cry out in fake pain for f2.8. This is a nice shot. Perfectly framed. Nice. Um, I'm on shot 33. <sighs> That's not even halfway done. I can do this, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Need some water. What the f are you doing without a in the EC on? Let's go. <laughs> what is this? You see this? I drank half of this in one go, and I'm still dehydrated. Pentax, you better appreciate the <laughs> out of me right now. F you. Dude, this is like the. Uh... Live, laugh, love sign world championship. This photo is pretty cool because I think it highlights the capability of the camera for situations like this. I basically just took the camera, preset all my settings, and I guess no scoped it right behind me so I wouldn't be noticed. And it actually worked. This photo is a vibe and capturing it was not so bad. And that may be in part due to the f-stop. Smells like shit over here. Here's likely why this camera is a 3.5. It uses something called zone focus or scale focus if you're a fish, which in my semi mostly completely non-professional opinion is total ass. This camera doesn't have autofocus or rangefinder. You're not even seeing through the lens here. You're gonna have to be guessing focus 
uh, sort of. You do have a focus ring on the front here that you adjust with symbols for infinity represented by the mountain all the way down to macro with the flower. In between are settings for, you know, family and friends, which, uh, you know, good for you if you have those. On the undercarriage or the uh, gooch of the lens, you have those approximate distances in both meters and feet. So that's kind of nice. So the thing is, I'm not super convinced this was the right move. Zone focusing is kind of more for the experienced street photographers who are, you know, unapologetically shoving cameras in people's faces, hoping they got something in focus. You know, camera in one hand and a coffee and a cigarette in the other. I don't personally overall see it as a good choice for a camera marketed to the introductory generation of film photographers. I personally would have liked to see some sort of autofocus mechanism instead. After all, it's 2024. If we have toilets with laser targeting systems that can spray your ass down with tactical efficiency like a prized hog at the county fair, we certainly have the technology to automate focus in a camera by now. Anyway, the filter thread on the lens is a 40.5 millimeter, and the light meter just above the lens here will actually sit behind the filter and meter through whatever filter you put on it. That's actually awesome. Good job, Pentax, you have pleased me. He probably thinks he's funny. Dude, it smells like shit out here. All right, check this out. I don't know if you can see it, but there's this like bird just chilling in there. Got a shot of it, dead center in frame. Hopefully it turns out. this maybe the shots over there at the next location I shot this which I consider to be quite good from experience I'd say this is what it feels like to be a prowler you know getting off to watching this trucker check his tire pressure <sighs> oh. <sighs> gotta be strong although I am very weak Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, at the shooting modes, which once again, the manual doesn't explain very well. Just light on fire dog and hurl it into the neighbor's yard or something. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. On the shooting mode dial here, you have uh, the white section, which are a bunch of shooting modes where flash will not fire. And then of course you have um, the yellow section where uh, flash will fire. And then of course you have this rogue, you know, auto button here where the camera just does everything for you. It decides whether or not it's gonna use flash based on the amount of light, just in case you're overwhelmed with choices or something. So you also have a P for program mode in both flash modes, which the manual just calls standard and doesn't really further elaborate. That's like, I don't know, being hungry at a party and then someone comes up to you and offers you a wet hot dog that they said that they just found, but then refuses to tell you where. There's also a uh, bokeh mode, although admittedly 3.5 on a crop format like half frame probably won't yield too much depth of field, but hey, you do you. And then of course there's a uh, there's bulb mode, which just holds the shutter open until you tell it to fuck off. Okay, so finally the viewfinder. There are actually two sets of frame lines inside the viewfinder. One for close up, like macro, I guess, and then uh, one for everything else. And boy howdy, you're gonna trip up on them sometimes, at least I did. That's actually what happened here. No, I didn't shoot an off balance photo because I was trying to look away from how hauntingly erotic it was to watch Caleb massacre that sweet cream. I just got visually tripped up in the moment over, you know, the dual frame lines. The cool thing is that through the viewfinder, when you have your eye up to it, you can actually see which uh, focus setting you're at, which comes in handy. I mean, I still ignored it like 99% of the time, but. Additionally, there are two LEDs in the viewfinder that tell you something. I don't know. Again, the manual is uh, no help here. The LEDs in this camera are orange and blue, and if you see them flashing like this, the kind of akin to a cop car, don't worry, you're not being arrested again for lighting camera manuals on fire on a spare the air day. It's just the camera likely telling you one of two things. If both the LEDs are going plumb wild like this, you know, flashing a lot, I think that means that you forgot to advance to the next frame. That's actually a, uh, a really nice feature. If the uh, orange is blinking like this, that means that the flash is still charging up and is not ready yet. When it stops blinking, that means you're good to go. And of course, it's signaling to you that the flash is 
you know, gonna fire. What does blue mean? Blue flashing. I think that means there's too much light. And finally, I'm not sure about this one, but I believe the constant blue light, so not this, but just the blue light being on, it means that you're operating out of the bounds of possible exposure on this camera. I did have that pop up a few times when I was shooting something really bright, but ultimately it, you know, wasn't an issue most of the time. Uh, portrait can handle it. Yeah, this is a cool shot. You know, shapes, colors, lines. I don't know, dude. Clearly it's a shitty photo. Let's just move on. Yeah, dude. Hmm. Fence. You know what? I got a thing for that. Not bolt cutters. There you go. That work. <laughs> nice and stable. Okay, that's better. All these people driving by right now are like, what the fuck is going on? So you just wave to them, say hey, <laughs> so you don't get arrested. That'll be a good one. Oh, that does not seem stable. That does not seem stable at all. Okay, okay. Nope, nope, no, -uh. absolutely not. Right, okay, so here's the hard part. Though you might think sitting through this video is the hard part. Who the hell was this camera made for? There seems to be enough evidence that this will be marketed towards the new generation of film photographers who are just starting to show interest. I mean, that's literally what they said in the video, so. え、まずはこのカメラのコンセプトについてですけども、え、今までの動画でご紹介させていただいた通り、アナログカメラの世界に入ってきた若い皆さんが思い切り楽しめるようなカメラがコンセプトとなります。it's not a bad approach, but I can tell you certainly at least one thing for me. It kind of sucks that this camera was not made for the enthusiasts. You know what I'm talking about. The film photography ride or die community, the people that kept film photography alive during the digital dark ages, long before I even picked it up as a hobby. The enthusiasts who are, you know, so deep in it that they're probably developing FOMA pan in their own piss at this point. This camera probably isn't really going to be for them. Well, maybe some of them. But I would imagine that if you're at that level, it's more about features and manual capability. Like I said, this approach by Ricoh and Pentax isn't a bad one. They're hoping to secure an interest in the younger generation who's much more invested in social media to carry this project into the future. It just would have been nice if maybe they considered what the community that was there beforehand wanted a bit more. And I don't know, maybe this is what the community wants and I'm just out of touch. It wouldn't be the first time. Another fence. Okay. Whew. But before we wrap up this video, I'd like to quickly thank today's sponsor, The Dark Room. If you shoot a lot of half frame or plan to with the release of this new camera, well, then look no further than The Dark Room, a lab that has been developing film for over 40 years. It's the only lab that I can personally trust to get my film done on time all the time, and I personally recommend to all my friends getting started in film photography to use them as well because of their wide selection of possibilities. The Dark Room just recently added even more custom options for your half frame film development and scanning. As I mentioned before, you can get half frame scanned as singles or even sacrifice a little bit of resolution and get them scanned as doubles, create an artistic pairing. Just choose one up or two up when you select half frame format under film developing. Getting your work developed through the darkroom has never been easier. I just fill out the online darkroom form, write my order number down, drop my rolls in the free mailer that they send you, seal it up and toss it in my nearest mailbox. The rest is taken care of. With a team of professionals using dip and dunk film processors followed up with high quality Noritsu film scanners that use advanced color algorithms, you can have the film look in any size that you want. Super scans do look amazing. Every roll will be handled as if it's the most important work of your own photographic career yet, and I love the fact that I can count on The Dark Room to deliver. If you have an order of film ready to go, head over to thedarkroom.com to get started or simply download The Dark Room app today. Oh, 
at the end of the roll. So yeah, this camera is certainly at the center of the film photography's focus right now. Pun intended, you big bitch. For many years now, the film photography community has wanted a major manufacturer of cameras to step in so that we don't really have to rely on you know, aging bodies anymore. It does make some sort of sense. There's still companies out there that made cameras during the film era that make digital cameras now, but they all ignored the call, except Pentax. And I think that's worth supporting. If for nothing else, the Pentax 17 being a brand new camera in 2024 means that it'll likely have spare parts availability and maybe even some way for it to be serviced for many years to come which is a big deal. I don't know how much this camera is going to cost at launch. Obviously, I'm recording this beforehand, but if you have the coin to support the project and you care about film, then why not? I think all of us in the community are pretty excited to see what happens next, but my fingers are definitely crossed that it leads to a heavier and more burdensome Pentax 673. So that's it. What a wild time. Harman produces a new color negative film. Pentax has a new film camera project. <sighs> Still no air chrome from Kodak though.